Hi, once again, everybody. I'm Ed Berliner. Welcome into the Talk Sports Network and another edition of Outside the Lines with former player agent and attorney Joe Casal, the man who knows all, sees all, tells all. How do I know this? Because we've known each other long enough and I know exactly what he knows. The man knows everything. Good to see you again, Joe. How you been? <laughs> Hi, Ed. Good to what be do I with keep you. calling you? I call you like, uh, what is it? The, the, the Not just the man who knows all, sees all, but what did we used to call you? I'm trying to think it was like, you know, um, the man who knows everything. I don't know what it is, but it, it, it was perfect. Well, let's not get carried away. <laughs> well, okay, but but it's good for marketing purposes, <laughs> you know, which is what we all know in this business anyway. All right, let's get to it because we got a, we got a, a hard issue here that's got to be discussed. And we're really, by the time we're done in this show, we're going to piss off a large group of people. I have no doubt about it, but they need to be pissed off and they also need to understand some reality. So let's dig into it. The University of Miami Athletic Department has become the poster child for everything that is wrong in big time college athletics. It's simple to see because here they are floundering about now with a college football program that is a complete dumpster fire in many ways. An ousted athletic director who may have done beautiful things for the chess team, but couldn't do it for the rest of the program. Finally, a president that's paying attention to what's going on at the university, which used to be every single year. One of those programs that you could count on would be in the college football playoff run, but is no longer, doesn't deserve to be there. But now we have to put in the fact, Joe, that as they look for a new head coach, which they will eventually, probably, and look for a new athletic director, a friend of ours, Dave Lamont, brought it up perfectly when he said, well, it's good to see all these people talking about the athletic director, but I'm sick and tired of people dancing on the graves and dancing on the grave of Manny Diaz. He's exactly right. Manny Diaz is still the head football coach, yet people are gloating about the fact that he's going to be out real soon. We can't wait to put somebody else in. Let's get Urban Meyer or Lane Kiffin in here. Let's drop somebody in. It is this dancing on the grave, which is endemic of what has happened at the University of Miami in Coral Gables, the fan base at Miami. And we're going to make sure we don't piss everybody off here, but there is a faction of the fan base in Miami, which is the rank stupidest angriest, most social media hating group of people that I've ever seen in athletics anywhere. And it affects everything across the board at the University of Miami when people think they're going to get great coaches. Joe, this is a culture that sooner or later, this university has got to address more than just finding an athletic director or a coach. They've got to address the fan culture here, which is keeping people from wanting to come to Coral Gables. Well, I mean, look, there is a Raider-esque element to portions of the Miami fan base that has not helped the university in the last 15 years. They've lost recruits because of it. They've lost coaching candidates because of it. Um, it's, it's been allowed to fester too long. And look, social media is a lot of things. One thing it's not, it ain't social. So there is always that faction in sports that when somebody gets fired, everybody's celebrating. Um, it's it's unfortunate. And look, I know Blake James. Blake's a good guy. Blake did not do a good job at Miami, and it happens. Um, there's a lot of fact. You know, there's a lot of reasons why it turned out. Some things are were under Blake's, you know, command to make better. Some were not. But the reality of it is, in sports, when things are not going well, changes take place. Um, the problem that Miami has is there's a churn that's going on. Um, Paul D., Kirby Ho, Kachon, I, of course, Blake, um, James. That's just in the last 15 years. Of and those are the athletic directors, directors, for those who don't know. Now we're, you know, I, it's, I'll make the assumption that Manny Diaz is not going to be back. You're looking at Manny, Al Gold, Mark Rick, who retired, but you're, you know, Randy Shannon, Al Golden, you know, Rand, you know, Larry all the Boker, way down. We go back and you're back talking and back. 15 to 17 years of churn. There's no stability. And that has to change. And there's a lot of reasons why there isn't stability. Um, well, let's let, let's look years, at that. This let's... used to be a job that people, it was a springboard to something else. But that hasn't been the case since Butch Davis left because nobody left this job as a football coach for a better job since Butch left. 
So we're looking at 20 years. So it's not that kind of a job. And so when fans get upset when they say, well, it's, we're not a second tier job. Well, you have been for 20 years. So the reality of it is, how do you change that? Well, you change that with the athletic director. You have to get a guy that's more Sam Jankovic than Blake James. How do you do that in this environment? You got to write a big check. You got to give that person autonomy. You have to recognize the problems that you have inherent within the program, some of which you can't correct. Look, you're a private school with a stadium 20 plus miles and a 40 minute bus ride away from campus. Those are the realities of it. And it is a challenge. It doesn't mean you can't overcome them. It just means there's challenges. You have a lunatic portion of this fan base that has done more damage than good over the last 15 years. Somehow you got to rein that in. Let's stay Whether right there for a second. Pulling let's, let's... people's season tickets for abusive behavior in the stands. Whether you, you you limit their you know activities that they can participate in, you've got to do something. Because here's the era that we're in in college sports now, Ed. Everybody's making money. You know, I mean, everybody. You want Lane Kiffin? Lane Kiffin's making five million dollars a year at Ole Miss. So you're going to have to pay Lane Kiffin five plus million dollars a year to come to Miami, plus support staff, assistant coaches, recruiting budget, you know, all of it. And whether it's Mario Cristobal, Lane Kiffin, Dave Aranda, no matter who you're bringing in, this isn't the days of we're going to go get a guy out of Pullman, Washington, nobody's ever heard of by the name of Dennis Erickson. He's going to walk into a national championship program with 40 cute kids on the roster that are going to play in the NFL. Those days are gone. You're getting a guy now, if you're looking to aim high, that's leaving an established program. He's not going backwards. He doesn't give a shit if it's hot or cold outside. He wants what he wants, what he already has, and then some. And what we have to point so, out here, though, is a guy like Lane Kiffin or any coach that you just alluded to is going to be able to make those kind of demands because there are jobs out there. There are schools leverage. willing to give coaches autonomy and a lot of money because they have it, even if they're smaller schools. So it's not as if all of a sudden the Miami job comes open and the coaches are going, ooh, the Miami job's open. I got to leave and drop everything to go to Miami. No, you don't, because you can go to at least 20 other schools right now and get treated better and get paid better and have a better opportunity to move your career forward than going to Miami. Miami is not a plum job anymore and people need to understand that. Sure, it can change, but right now, it's not the, the be all get all that people thought it was. Well, I mean, it's not USC, it's not LSU. Right. Um, it's on the level of Washington, which doesn't make it a bad job. In fact, you know, it all gets down to the kind of person you bring in, Ed. You bring in a guy that already wants to move into the mansion that is furnished and appointed, or do you bring in the guy that says, you know what, I see that stick of dirt there and the mansion is halfway finished, but I can really make this my own deal. And that's the, that's the selling point. That's what you can do. The irony is, I, I'll tell you a quick story. In 2004, I had a meeting with the late athletic director, Paul D. And I said to Paul, I said, Paul, there is an arms race going on in college athletics right now with facility development. Schools all over the country are putting millions of dollars in the facilities. If Miami doesn't get in that game, you're going to fall behind. And he looked me straight in the eye and smiled and said, we don't have to do that here. We're Miami. And I said to him, Paul, if that's the prevailing attitude, you will be irrelevant by 2008. And if you look at it, that's exactly what took place. Yes. Miami began to get lapped. Here's the irony in 2021. Miami's got good facilities now. They have sure. invested a lot of money in facilities. They're not losing the arms race for because of facilities anymore. You know what they're losing the arms race in? Personnel. Look at the, go get an Alabama university media guy look at the number of analysts on nick saban's coaching staff <laughs> makes a difference you're putting all of these minds in a room 
and, the, and you're having to compete against three former NFL head coaches sitting on a staff. Well, see, and that's, and, but, but let's stop there. You're right. But I want to expand on this for one second. Here's where it makes a difference. You want Mario Cristobal to come home? Mario worked for Nick. Mario sees what Nick was doing, does the same thing in Oregon. He's got a team third in the country. You think Mario's coming home for a step backward or two? No. He wants what he already knows works. So that's going to be the challenge for Miami now. It's not the buildings. They have the buildings. It's are we going to pump the money into the program to be competitive? And I personally, I think they're going to do that now. And the reason why I say that But is they have to. Their they backs got, are against the they wall. They have no other place to go. Exactly. And the ACC brought Miami and Florida State in, and they figured we're gold. And Florida State, in a lot of ways, held up their end when Jimbo brought in a national champion, and they played Miami is not at all. So if you don't think the conference is putting pressure on Miami to say, guys, Got to get this one right. Got to hire the right AD. Got to hire the right coach. You know, you still can't get the ACC network in a lot of places. You think if Miami were to hire a Mario Cristobal or a Lane Kiffin, just using those guys as examples because they're national names, all of a sudden that doesn't make the product that the ACC is trying to sell to cable outlets, their network, more viable? Of course it does. So, it, it's imperative that they get it right now. It's imperative that they don't make another hiring mistake, which is why hiring the athletic director first has to happen. And you have to have a guy that's a visionary. You have to have someone that is going to shake the le le lethargic nature of this program. And if you get that, you'll get the right football. Coach. Which is a good point, because if you go back and again, we're going back to what is ancient history that you and I are both aware of and so many other people are. Sam Jankovic came in and he was he was a, a, a divisive influence in many ways. He was a tree shaker. He didn't give a crap what anybody thought about him. But Jankovic was able to get that sort of autonomy that he needed. And he said, we are going to add basketball. We are going to do this to the facilities. We are going to do this to go out and find it. And if you don't like it, you can fire me. And of course, they didn't because Jankovic was successful. I don't know if those kind of athletic directors actually exist anymore, Joe. And if they do, you got to go out and find them. And again, would an athletic director as good as that want to get involved in the absolute mess that is Miami? That's what people are forgetting here, is that the program right now is a disaster. And, and while they can say, oh, well, we're winning national championships in badminton, I don't care. You're not getting it done in football, baseball, and basketball which are the three well, sports where you got to make your money, especially football. Well, you have to understand, though, athletic directors are like coaches in the sense that they're very competitive yep. and they can see this as really what it was in the 80s that, that Howard Schnellenberger saw it as, that Sam Jankovic saw it as, that it can be a hidden giant again. The difference is they already have five national championships. They have something to sell. They do have a history. For all of the problems that Miami has, what happened when Alabama played Miami to start the year? Buffalo television ratings, because Miami still, in television's eyes, which is what rules the roost, right. still something. Can they attract a Sam Jankovic-like figure today? Sure. You got to write the check. These guys are not okay. under right. Ed. They're just like coaches. Give me the money, and I'm coming. And the autonomy. And, you have to give me the but, ability but to make what? the decisions if pay and an stay out of my face. What the market is paying right now, yes. they're going to have no other choice but give them autonomy because they're going to take the job unless they get it. I mean, you know, they, like coaches, you know, those guys have options too. Like a Mac Rhodes at Baylor. You know, you find me a guy in the country. Here's, here's what Mac Rhodes did. He took a program that in basketball, the last basketball coach had a murder that he covered up of one of his own players. Hired a guy who was squeaky clean reputation, wins a national championship. Had a football program 
that had a coach that was as dirty and scummy as it got in our Bryles. Okay? Brought in a guy like Matt Rule who ended up getting an NFL job. Then brought in another guy in Dave Aranda who's a star coach. Okay? And you want to talk about tough? Kim Mulkey won multiple national championships at Baylor. She was as close to a goddess as there was in the campus. He didn't put up with any of her crap and let her go to LSU. There's a strong personality. There's a guy. If you hired Mac Rhodes at Miami and you were a Miami fan, you go to bed at night saying, we're good. We're going to fix this. So those guys are out there. And, you know, it's imperative that they get it. Now, I'm not associated with the program anymore. I'm not around it every day. I don't know who are going to be the people that make those hiring decisions. And neither does anybody. Let's put it this way. All of this dropping of sources and this AD and this coach, absolute, total, undeniable, flaming bullshit. Because none of this is coming from inside the University of Miami program. As you have pointed out to me many times, these guys are lockdown mode. And anybody who says that they're being told something from the inside of the University of Miami is absolutely full of shit. Yeah, I mean, and one thing they're doing right right now for the first time in 18 years is they're not talking. And that's good. good. You know, I mean, let everybody <laughs> speculate. But you don't, but the, but the people who are in the this position to make these decisions are not talking and not leaking. And that's a good thing because if you are Mario Cristobal, if you are Lane Kiffin, if you are Dave Aranda, the last thing you want to do is be addressing job rumors when you're in the season. Exactly. That pisses them off. And you know, and the other thing is there are times in life you have the hammer. There are times in life you are the nail. There are times in life you have leverage. There are times in life you don't. Right now, every good athletic director and head football coach has the leverage. To balance that out, if you're Miami, you got to be professional. Don't make the current jobs more difficult for those guys. Be quiet. Go about your business. Do your due diligence. Because, you know, for all of us on the outside, who are looking at who we may like, who may want. You know, when you start doing due diligence on people and you find out some things about them personally that may not fit what you want. You know, those are. this is the reason why you have to do these things quietly. And if you do that, you have a better chance of getting the right guy than you have for the last 20 years when they have habitually gotten the wrong guy. Let's, you know, and so... I, I want to take that's that one. That's going to be, that's their biggest challenge right now, is getting the AD right. Because it isn't, as you brought up earlier, it's not just football. It's basketball. It's baseball. It's an, it's an athletic department. It's yep. not just football. Which and is why we have to stop this nonsense challenge. every time I hear one of these wing nuts go off on a line and say that Ed Reed would be the perfect athletic director. Gino Toretta would be the perfect athletic director. Alonzo Highsmith, well, look, Alonzo works in an NFL office. That doesn't make any difference. Don't you people get it? There is a massive Grand Canyon-esque rift difference between being an assistant in a National Football League office and then coming in and running an athletic department at a major university. It's not the same thing. Because here's the guy at the athletic department who has to then worry about our sneaker contracts, who has to worry about the building moratorium, who's got to worry about the people sitting on the board of directors. You're sitting over here in the National Football League. You don't have to worry about all that. You need somebody who walks in here with experience to be able to do that. To put this, and again, it's this nonsense that drives me insane, where people always go to legacies that we have to put in here. Yet don't need legacies. You need people who are good at their job. And they don't have to necessarily be somebody who graduated from Coral Gables. Well, I, I or any place I for that matter. Because I wrote about this, I wrote about this last week. If we had the internet when oh. Sam Jankovich got on a plane after Howard Schnellenberger left to go to Stillwater, Oklahoma, to bring a coach back who was 30 and 25, who did, had an 0 and 5 record to Oklahoma and Nebraska who was running 
uh, antique offense, and his name was Jimmy Johnson. The internet would have broken. Would have been destroyed. And demanded Sam Jankovic be fired. And on top of it, one of the stipulations for Jimmy taking a job is he had to keep half of Howard's staff, and they mutinied on him in the first year. See, nobody who was, you know, around now, they don't remember those days. They don't, they don't want to remember them, Joe, because they look at you and me and they Jones. say, it's ancient history. You guys are living in the past. It doesn't fly anymore here in, here in 2021. It does. The basic concept of what concept we're talking about works. Bringing an, a guy from the outside, you wouldn't have known if Jimmy Johnson was going to be a great football coach from anything. You know, you wouldn't have known. Nobody was going to predict that. Hell. I was here when half of the so-called UN insiders wanted Jimmy Johnson fired after a year because he didn't get along with Howard Stern. Right. Yep. So, and you know, it's it's just listen, hiring people is hard. Hiring people in the internet and social media era is really hard because you may think you made a great hire, and then all of a sudden there's a buried arrest record that comes out a week after you hire the guy, and you go, oh shit. You know, and it happens everywhere, Ed. It doesn't just happen here. Right. It happens everywhere. Two years ago, Ed Ogeron is the toast of college football. Two years and $17 million a year buyout later, he's out. That's how fast it changes. So for me, the one encouraging thing I've seen in the last week with Miami for the first time in 18 years is that nobody of substance is talking which means that for once they're doing the thing right. Now we see where it goes. I mean, I'm one of these people who thinks that they can get it right and hire a great football coach, a kick-ass athletic director, and turn it around. It's just that they don't have a mulligan left. You know, no, you have no more balls in the bag yet. You got one more ball and you're on the 12th hole. So, you know. You the screw this one up, ball. you're in the water. It, <laughs> yeah, you're screwed. So hopefully they get it right. Because while I'm not involved with them anymore, I still root from afar that they get it right. Let's then address in the, in the last part of the show here, something that we alluded to early on and we want to get down to. You talked about social media. <laughs> we are not here to slam 100% of the University of Miami fan base or any other fan base for that matter, because what's happening in Coral Gables is very endemic to what's happening in a lot of programs, but not to this level. There is a lunatic fringe who covers and who roots for the University of Miami, and it blows up on social media, and it's destructive. It is hateful. It is dance on the grave of Manny Diaz because you suck. You've destroyed us. We can't wait for you to get out. While the guy is still sitting there, look, he never stole a freight train last time I checked, but he's still trying to do a job, and he's having to do it under these conditions. The social media aspect of what is Miami is destructive to where it is harming everybody. Do you really think athletic directors, coaches, people who want to come here to work don't see this? Do they really want to come to a place where the fans are threatening the coaches, threatening the players, calling out the recruits, naming their mother and father, sending out addresses and phone numbers? Do they really want to be a part of that? That's part of the culture here, Joe. And people will say, Ed, you and Joe are way off the beam here. Look, that happens everywhere. This happens at every college. No, it doesn't. And you can speak to that, Joe, because we've talked about it before. What's happening in Miami is a culture issue. There's a fan issue here, and that's got to be cleaned up as well. Oh, no question. I mean, and for people who say it happens everywhere, let's, let's say you're right. Why do you want to be lumped into that? Why do you want to be like everybody else? Wouldn't it, make se wouldn't it make your school more appealing if you were not like everybody else? So, yeah, I mean, it has hurt them in the past. I don't know if it's going to hurt them in this search or not because I'm not involved in this search. But I could tell you point blank, the last two times they looked for athletic directors, there were guys that stepped away from the job because they were not interested in dealing with that nonsense. And, you know, that's going to have to get cleaned up because if it doesn't, it's going to weigh down the next coach. It doesn't matter who you hire. You know, they could hire Lane Kiffin tomorrow. 
and everybody will go crazy. We got the lane train. It's going to be wonderful until he loses a game. <laughs> exactly. Then they're going to go crazy. <laughs> and all of that can be fan behavior. Where it crosses the line is when players' families in the stands and fans start mothering them and start cursing at them. When families write to the university and say, you know, I bring my kids to the game and the vulgarity and the drunkenness and the nastiness, I can't take my kids to the game anymore. That's where it impacts. That's where it's got to get cleaned up. Having some dipshit on the internet write a bunch of crap, that has a, that, that's minor Minimal. in comparison to the stuff that goes on in the stands. It has to get cleaned up because people aren't going to go to the games. Well, it's all part of and it. I mean, what we're talking about, you're right. It's all, and, and that's you can all, avoid the social media. You cannot read it. You, know, you can walk away from the tweets and all the Facebook posts. Right. But it leaves a mark with people. And it creates and helps to foment this disgusting, despicable nature of hate against college athletes and people who are just trying to earn a job. I mean, that's, that's the worst part of it. And you're right. Look, I've been to games before, uh, games before at, the, at the Swamp in Gainesville. I've been at, at Doe Campbell Stadium. I've been at the Big House. I've been at a lot of places. Boston College, I was at a lot of different places. UCLA. I have never in my career, Joe, witnessed the kind of vile behavior that goes on at a University of Miami game. It happened at the Orange Bowl, and it's worse now where it is right now. The school's got to do something about this. Look, if you want to take away tickets, do something. Screw the social media. But you got to clean these clowns out of there because it is going to hurt you, not just in the AD and the head coach, Joe, but it's going to hurt you in recruiting as well. Why do I, as a parent, want to send my kid there? I don't. Guess what? FAU is right up the street. FIU is down the street. USF and UCF are up there as well, and they're looking for my kid. I can get a better education. I don't have to worry about him or her being called a jackass by a moron in the stands. Well, it just gets, it just makes a hard job more difficult. Look, yes, the whole concept of the late Howard Schnellenberger's recruiting philosophy of the state of Miami, that's over forever. And it's over forever because life has changed. Students down here now want to go out of state to school, not just athletes, but even non-athletes. The out of state, you know, kids want to have a different experience. They want to have different college experience. They want to have a different lifestyle experience. So you're never going to get a 24-person recruiting class and 18 of them are going to be from Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County nope. anymore. Those days are done. The idea is to get the right kids, and then when you get them, develop them and make the experience so good that they tell their friends who are underclassmen, you got to come here. See, what gets lost in everybody talking about the legacy of Miami and all this stuff is that you know why it was effective in the 80s and 90s? Is because those kids had great experiences. Yes. And those experiences got sold to underclassmen and their friends and their parents. In the 2000s, these kids don't have a great experience. So they're not selling it. And their parents aren't selling it to their friends and the underclassmen and all of that. All of that has to change. Whether you win six games a year or 11 games a year, you should be able to have a good experience. When you don't have it, it has really harmful effects all the way down the line because now parents say, hey, look, my kid went there for four years and it sucked. We had to sit in the stands right. and deal with drunks. We had to go home and have my daughter crying because she read crap on on social media and this happens brother come on people be be honest joe and i are telling you things that happens this is the stuff that has to get cleaned up you have strong people in areas of leadership it gets cleaned up you don't it doesn't and it festers all of it has to get cleaned up that's why the athletic director that takes over this job has got a big job ahead of him and uh, doesn't mean it can't be done been done other places it just has to get done and that's all part of what it's going to take the new ad to bring the university's athletic department and athletic programs back up to where they were and i think what people are missing what the real fans are missing what the nut job fans are missing what a lot of the media is missing as well the nightmare, the disaster, the dumpster fire that has been the University of Miami for several years 
is being used against them by other athletic directors, by other coaches, by big recruiters, by high school coaches as well. It has filtered down to that point where you have even high school coaches who will be telling their kids, you don't want to go to Miami. You don't need to be part of that. Matter of fact, I'm going to send you someplace else. And there's competing athletic directors who are out there, Joe, saying, we don't want to be like Miami. It's like, you know, ooh, ooh you, you, went, you stepped in Miami. <laughs> it's, it's the way it's gone right now. Joe, I don't think people realize the, the negative effects that this university has pushed forward and how other universities around the country are using this now as an example of everything not to do. Well, you have a show with Larry Bluestein. Nobody's closer to high school football down here than Larry. Ask Larry about, you know, we Miami have, we've talked about it and, and the challenges of it. It's a huge challenge. And, you know, it, like I said, it doesn't mean you can't fix it. One thing in sports sure. is the one common denominator in sports is change. And you can change things, but it's going to take a big effort. It's going to take people, you know, people being really aggressive on the front end. If you act out at a game, you're losing your tickets. I don't give a shit if you've donated a million dollars to the university or a hundred bucks, you're out. Gone. And, you know, fan, look, fan behavior is a problem across sports, college and pro around the country. You look at attendance figures in the major sports, they're all on the decline. It isn't just pandemic related. When you when when these school when these teams and programs send surveys out, one of the things that comes back in large numbers is we don't enjoy the stadium experience because we're tired of dealing with drunks and vulgarity and garbage. I can't take my kids to the game. I can't do that. And so this is something that at the professional level and the college level, it's a huge problem. True. So, you know they're going to have to address it here. They're, like I said earlier, there is a Raider fan-like segment of this fan base. And that's not a compliment. <laughs> no, and what's happened is they have the same lack of success the Raiders have had all these years. And on top of everything else, it's no longer a tough venue to play, like Oakland was. You know, right. when, you know when the Raider fans were just crazy instead of nasty and crazy, Oakland used to be a tough place to play. Same as the Orange Bowl, it once won 58 straight games. Used to be a tough place to play. These places aren't tough places to play anymore because just being nasty ain't going to carry the day. So nobody. So what, what it does is ends up hurting you because you lose your fans. And what ends up happening is all those tickets are on secondary ticket markets. And guess who buys them? The road team. Opposing fans. Let's yeah. have a weekend in Miami. Wouldn't that be fun coming down from Michigan? No problem. You get a game with Michigan State, it's 50,000 people in the stands, 30,000 of them are from Michigan. And I can get a, a nice $20 day. ticket because it's not that expensive. There's not enough people to That's go. That's right. Look, I'll make we're a not, great weekend of it. We need to make sure that we are not hammering every single fan of Miami no. or any other program. We are not doing that. But we are calling out the lunatic fringe. And that's part of the problem. People, lay back a little. Come on. You don't have to hammer away at Manny Diaz and his family, as I've seen and heard on social media. You don't have to have an audio podcast out there where you're basically excoriating Diaz and his assistants. You don't have to have a video show out there put together in mommy's basement where you're out there talking about how bad things are and how the players suck. They're 18, 19, 20 years old. Back the hell off for crying out loud. You're not helping. Look. <laughs> You're not helping. Manny Diaz, <laughs> look, the reality of Manny Diaz is he's not a good head football coach. No. He shouldn't have gotten this job unless he, you know, was somewhere else to learn the chops. Correct. But the guy didn't do anything illegal here. The guy's carried himself like a gentleman. His kids are still playing hard for him. You may not like the results. Those kids are still playing hard, which means that – he didn't lose the locker room. He's just at this stage of his head coaching career, not the guy for this job. So let him go out in the next two weeks and play his games and end the season and move on. 
You don't have to rip them every day. I mean, I felt bad for him the other day having to stand before the media and having to answer Blake James questions because that's above his pay grade. He, you know, I mean, Blake James lost his job, not because of Manny Diaz. That may have been a part of it in terms of the hire, but Blake James's problems as athletic director were much larger than Manny yes. Diaz. If it was just making a bad football hire, guess what? He would have had the opportunity to make another hire because every athletic director worth the salt has hired the wrong guy. It happens. It, his problems were deeper, but to have to have the head football coach, in essence, being the spokesperson for the entire university, that's a bad position to put him well, in. And part Especially of that... when his job is tenuous. I mean, what's he supposed to say? Exactly. You know, really. and, and part of it is what you have now as a press corps at any college, at Miami or any place else, has now been polluted by a number of people who are there who have zero concept of how to actually report. They are there as bloggers. They are there as Ojan provocateurs. They are there as people to stick the needle in somewhere and basically get a reaction. They don't know the game. And yeah, you can go ahead and say there were a bunch of old farts sitting here talking about the old days. No, that's used to be how you covered a team, how you, you don't you don't drag all this other nonsense into it. You ask one question, you walk away. But they got to drill them because they're waiting for that reaction that can go up on my podcast, go up on my YouTube channel, that I can tweet out here, that I can talk about having exclusive exclusivity to, which is just nonsense. That's part of the problem, Joe. Bring, bring the temperature down a little bit. We can sit here and we can get, our, and we can get angry about it. And we can sit here and, and, and pontificate about it. But at the end of the day, you and I are not sitting here calling guys' names and screeching at him, except, of course, we're calling them the lunatic fringe of the fan base, which they've earned. So I'll well, take that one. Well, <laughs> look, the, 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 the simple adage is the difference between reporting 25 years ago and reporting today is that 25 years ago, anything that any writer were to say to a coach, he was going to say to his face. Yes. He was not going to say it behind his yes. back. 25 years later, none of these people, will say the things they say online to a coach or a player to their face. Nope. No, it just won't happen. You do have in college sports more than pros, the fan element of these websites that get their credentials and all of that stuff that make it a little more difficult. But at the end of the day, Ed, it's still about being a pro, you know, and you're going to go there and you're going to act professionally. And you go and, and you do your job. I mean, like I said, I feel bad for Manny Diaz because it, he's dead man walking. He knows he's done in two weeks. Everybody knows he's done in two weeks. And oh, by the way, he's got two more weeks of football to coach. And he's got to get kids ready to play. And he's got to get them to care. And then he's got to try to keep the younger players around that they don't go into the transfer portal. Because above all else, Manny's a guy that still loves University of Miami. It's not like he hates it. You know, he's not failing because he wants to fail exactly you know? and so it's just the whole thing is that uncomfortable period where everybody knows it's over but it's not over yet and 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 it's and that's always difficult I and mean, in sports that's always the difficult time it's the manager having to manage the last 30 games in september when he knows he's not going to have a job at the end of the year and has to answer the same question every day about his job security. It just, you know, it is what it is. Look, but I it give, doesn't I, mean it's not uncomfortable. I give Manny Diaz a lot of credit. He hasn't come out and said anything. He hasn't spit. He hasn't decided to go ahead and take the front line. When Ed Ogeron at LSU, he basically has said out in front at press conferences, oh, I'm a lame duck. He said that. I'm a lame duck coach. And he's basically not caring because he knows he's out at this. I mean, that's a kind of attitude. Well, he's got 17 million reasons not, not to care. To care. <laughs> but, but if you want to go ahead and hammer somebody for helping to destroy a program, go after a guy like Ed Ogeron at LSU. Don't go after a guy like Manny Diaz. He's lost some games. Okay, Manny's going to move on. Maybe he'll be successful someplace else. God, I hope he is. I hope he really is successful someplace else. But you don't need to drop all these hammers on people. Because like I said, and what, like you said, some days you're a hammer, some days you're the nail. Stop making everybody else the nail for crying out loud, at least for a And day. stop making the place less attractive. Toxic. Toxic. Where they're replaced. And that's what, that's what people who aren't in this business don't understand. They, they're living in a belief 
that no matter how bad we act, this job is so great, anyone will take it. Gone. And what I come back to is how great was the Alabama job before Nick Saban took it over again? They went through how many coaches for how many years? Gene Stallings won a national championship at Alabama. They ran them off, okay? That was one of the most hateful places to coach. Bill Curry, one of the greatest people you'll ever meet in sports, was successful there. They blew him up. Mike Shuler, you can go down the line. Look at all the coaches Alabama churned through before Nick got there. And what changed? It wasn't just winning. But Nick was an outsider. He had no Alabama connections. He wasn't going to put up with the Alabama bullshit. He was going to implement his program. He was given autonomy to do it. And what happened? Built a dynasty. Built a dynasty. Yeah. Because he, he actually... That can happen. Thing. That's the template that you're looking at at Miami. And you can say, well, that'll never happen again. Maybe not. Maybe but not. Guess what? You want Mario Cristobal? That's where Mario's learned his chops, okay? It wasn't just playing for Dennis Erickson. It was learning his chops with Nick Saban, seeing how to do the gig the right way. Yes. So that's that's all part of it. And, and, and you know, it's like a gumbo. You've got to put all of these <laughs> things into the pot in order for it to taste good. And, you know, Miami... This is an important time for them. They can't mess up these hires. They can't. They no longer can do it. And if that means they have to tamp down the lunatic fan base, then they got to tamp them down. Please. And that's just the way it is. If they screw and this they up, they're that, going to be... Things are going to work out for them. If they screw this up, they're going to be irrelevant for another 10 years, maybe another 20, and well, I've told people... If they screw this up, they become Vanderbilt. Well, I've and I've told it's, people awesome. the way Miami is being run right now... I don't see them ever competing for a national championship again, maybe not in the next 10 years. Sure, everything changes. I mean, it's cyclical, but they've got to change the culture. And if they don't but, change I mean, look, the culture, you, they're you DOA. Hire, you hire the right coach, it changes in two everything years. Changes. Two years everything ago, changes. Two years ago, LSU was the, was the toast of college football, greatest offense ever, one of the five or six greatest teams ever, you know, scored almost 50 points against Alabama. Look at what they are. And two years from now... They're below 500 teams. So yep. it can change, but you need the right people in place. To you got to make the right people and you got to pay the right money. All right. We've 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 gone over time again, as always, but what we have to, because Christ, there's so much here. I mean, we could do another three days, but we'll come back and we'll do it again next week. Uh, reminder that if you want to get a hold of Joe Casal, uh, there is only one way to do it. He's on Facebook at Chef Casal, where he also tells stories of the amazing Tasso, uh, the, the dachshund that everybody in America now loves because he is the perfect little boy. Um, but you can also read Joe there where he writes. Joe writes a lot about this stuff and puts it up on his Facebook page. So you'll be smart to get there because you'll read a lot of this as well. And then we'll get a chance to do it here and push it out. Mr. C, always a pleasure, my friend. Uh, pet the puppy. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Ed. Good to be with you. Always is. Joe Casal, one of my best friends and actually the guy who does know all, see all, tell all, the man who knows everything. Get a hold of me. Go to Facebook and Twitter at Berliner Speaks. Also, don't forget, see this show, all the shows we do with Joe Casal and all of our shows at TalkSportsNetwork.com. Free for all, Silverman on soccer, the blue sheet with Larry Bluestein and many more that are coming up soon. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Uh, for Joe Casal, for Tasso, for my puppies, for everybody here, I'm Ed Berliner. Rock on, true believers. See ya.